So I was born in 1975, which means that I spent most of my memorable childhood years in the 80s. Anybody else in here grew up in the 80s? Yeah. Uh, it was a magical time, really, uh, because uh, we, we had all these TV and movie producers who, who got in cooperation with all the, the toy manufacturers, and they got corporate sponsors, and we had just unlimited amount of great toys to ask our parents to buy for us. And so it was really a child's dream and a parent's nightmare. And so, yeah, so I spent the 80s watching all those shows and movies. Uh, I love G.I. Joe. Anybody, anybody a G.I. Joe fan? Man, great toys. Blew lots of those up with fireworks, right? That's what you did with G.I. Joe toys. Uh, how about Transformers? Any Transformers fans out there? Love Transformers. Man, that was a cool idea. Robots that were also cars. Like, how cool is that? Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Any of those fans out there? Man, that's great stuff. Cowabunga, dude. Great, great time. And, and, and then, of course, there was Star Wars, and I've been a Star Wars fan since, you know, the day they came out. Love that stuff. And maybe not love the marketing machine that they become, but love the story, right? Uh, so, but then there was one of my favorites, Masters of the Universe. Anybody remember Masters of the Universe? Man, that was a weird show, right? Uh, I mean, it was, it was set in a medieval story. You know, there was swords and castles, and yet somehow it was in space, and they had laser guns. And so I... Uh, so they just melded all the best stuff together. It was ultimately this epic battle between He-Man and Skeletor. And He-Man was this great hero, man. He was this muscly guy who outfought and outthought and outran and outplanned the enemy every time and just loved it. And, and one of the coolest things about it was he had an alter ego, like all great heroes do, do which was Prince Adam. And Prince Adam was this kind of mild-mannered, unassuming guy. But when he took his sword and he held it aloft and he said, by the power of Grayskull, like he got a spray tan and took his shirt off and he became He-Man. And, and it was really the worst secret identity ever because they looked exactly alike. But, but it was wonderful because don't we all want to be a better version of ourselves? Like, all, don't we all want to be stronger and smarter and faster and get rid of all of those things that we don't like about ourselves and our personality quirks and our insecurities and, and man, just become a hero? And I know for me, you know, still to this day, we all have things about our lives that we wish we could change, don't we? Like we all have these flaws. Maybe you have flaws in your appearance that you see every time you look in the mirror. There's flaws in, in your ability every time you try to do something. There's flaws in your personality that no matter how hard you try, you just can't seem to get over. There's flaws in your past that you can never erase. And so we struggle, don't we? And, and do you ever wonder, like, like well, how long am I going to struggle with this? How long am I going to, going to wrestle with this? Isn't there a way for me to get past this struggle? And, and I'm going to just tell you this this morning. I think it's really simple. That the reason we struggle is because of the system that we live in. If there's things about your life that you wish you could change, things about your past that you wish you go back and redo, it's because you've thought you've done something wrong or there's something wrong about you. And when we feel that way, there's always shame and guilt and fear and insecurity and so often, the system that we use to fix that is the system of more, that, that, we, that we try to find something more to put on top of that, to cover it up, to, to mask it, to hide it, to fix it, so that, that we don't have to think about those things. And so we get into this system of more management, that we're always trying to add more so that we feel better about the things that we don't like. But the problem is, is every day we have to add more, don't we? And then there's some days where I forget to add my more, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to have to add two more tomorrow. And is that going to be enough? Is that, is that going to work? And, and then you're always waking up in the middle of the night going, you know, with all this more I've put on my life, like I still know that that thing is underneath here, that I've not erased it by anything I've done. And so, so I'm always wondering, do people see that thing through my more? Like, like is it showing? Does some people see it? Does everybody see it? And so, so we just double down on our efforts and we try to find new mores and we add them and we trade them and we just try to find the right more combo to fix all the things we don't like about ourselves. And then one day we wake up and we're just crushed by this system of more that we've put on ourselves. And if you ever want to get out of that struggle, it's really simple. You have to get a new system. If you ever want to change that, you have to get a new system. Today we're jumping back in. We're right in the middle of a, a series on the book of Colossians. We're going to start in Colossians chapter 2 today. So if you want to find that, that's where we'll be at. Colossians is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul and his disciple Timothy to the Christians at Colossae. And, and in it, what we found out over and over again is that they keep telling us to make Jesus first. That Jesus has to be first in everything. Jesus is first in everything. 
But today we're going to get to why we need to do that and how we need to do that. So let's jump in here. Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that may sound reasonable. For I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are in the strength of your faith in Jesus. So then, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. And so that's great. So, so Paul just gives us kind of this simple metric. He says, if you're saved because of Jesus, if you're forgiven because of Jesus, if you're, if you're a Christian because of Jesus, then continue in Jesus. And so what he's telling us today is that if we want the power of victory in our life, if we want to live a victorious life, then we must always make Jesus first and only. Like it can't be Jesus plus anything else. It has to be Jesus and Jesus alone. And so he goes on in verse 7 to, to show us that process. He says, we continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. And so, so this all starts with us getting rooted in our faith. And so that's that moment when we recognize that we're not the hero of our story, but Jesus is the hero of our story. And we say, God, I need you to save me. And we accept what Christ did for us. And we become a Christian. And, and, and we build this foundation, not on ourselves or on our mores, but on Jesus. And then it says, when we do that, the beautiful thing is, is Jesus begins to build things on that foundation. As we get to know him and get to know his word and we obey him and we follow him and we learn to trust him more, he begins to build this, this process in our life that eventually is going to establish us. So we don't have fear and we don't have worry because of what Jesus is doing in our life. And when that gets completed, you know what happens? Is that our life overflows. Like, like we're full of everything that we need because we have Jesus at the foundation and the author. And we also spill out on others so that they would know the hope of Jesus. And so, so that's spiritual maturity. We talked about that last week. That is the process that Jesus wants to work in your life. Great. Sounds like a good deal. But there's a problem. Next verse, verse 8. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. So the, uh, the reason that Paul and Timothy wrote this letter and send it to the, sent it to this church was uh, because of a guy named Epaphras. Uh, Epaphras had grown up in Colossae. Uh, he had met Paul probably in Ephesus, heard Paul's teaching, got saved, went back to Colossae, spread the gospel of Jesus, saw people get saved and helped establish the church there. And so then Epaphras, now at the, writing, at the time of the writing of this letter, was in Rome with Paul, and he was telling Paul about the church back home. And he told them, Paul, there's some people who are deceiving people in the church. There's people who are teaching things that are incorrect. And so Paul and Timothy write this letter to try to correct some of that thinking. And apparently, they were listening to worldly philosophies and trusting in human traditions. They're relying on what Paul calls the elements of the world. Other places we've seen that translated this way, that it was elemental spirits or basic principles of the worldly realm. We, we could maybe just call it the powers of the universe, right? So somebody was deceiving them to not just trust in Jesus. They weren't getting rid of Jesus, but they were adding to Jesus trust in these worldly principles, these human traditions. And, and, we, and we don't know all of what that encompassed as we read through the book, but we do know some of the things. And, and as we look at it, it was all about that more management, that Man, it's great to trust in Jesus, but you got to make sure you follow this rule, and you got to make sure you do this thing, you make sure you, you pray this way, and, and there's all these additions they were adding on to those who were trying to follow Christ. Some things that we see that it talks about in the rest of this chapter is circumcision, which was the sign of the Old Testament covenant. And they were saying, you got to make sure you do that too. They were talking about the Old Testament food laws, which Jesus had said were abolished. He said, I've made all things clean. But they were saying, well, but you still better eat this way, just to be sure. They're telling them about following certain Jewish festivals, which were, again, part of that old covenant. And Jesus had established new things that we celebrate, like the Lord's Supper and the believer's baptism. It also includes things like self-punishment and even worshiping angels. And, and he sums it all up down in verse 20 when he asks this question. He says, if you died with Christ... To the elements of this world, the, the powers of the universe, why do you live as though you still belong to them? Why do you submit to human regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish 
by being used up, and they are human commands and doctrines. And so, so they're saying that any of those things that they added on that were more, those weren't God's principles, they were, those were human principles. And it reveals this temptation that we have all the way up to today, which is to keep adding more requirements to our faith than Jesus did. I was uh, reading an article recently by a, a church consultant named Tom Rayner. You guys want to turn this down just a little bit? Uh, and and he, uh, he's a church consultant. He walks around, uh, goes around the country, meeting with churches, trying to help them with some of their problems. And, and he, get, he got down to reading the church bylaws at these churches, and he found some really weird stuff that churches say are a part of being a part of that church. So here's some of his highlights. So he said, uh, one rule he found in a church in their bylaws was that no one can bring a colored drink to church, especially red Kool-Aid, because that's the devil's Kool-Aid, right? Like, and it also stains carpets. But, but, you know, so, but you can't be a part if you bring red Kool-Aid. No go. Another one, uh, defined an active member as one who gives at least one penny a year. So Jesus plus one cent getting you into heaven in that church. Another one said, no one can sell cassette tapes on church grounds, but I think eight tracks and vinyl records are totally okay. So, Another one said, no glitter is allowed in the church. Beverly Percival, amen that in the first service. So she's our church custodian. No one can sell paintings on church grounds. And then this last one, this is just terrible. No one can come to church if you have diarrhea. And so, so as you can see, there is like a lot of trouble to get into churches. And, and most of those things are what? Human traditions that we've added to our faith. So Paul gives us an answer on how, how, to, how to resolve that. Let's, let's jump back to verse 9. It says, For the entire fullness of God's nature, everything about God dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. And you've been filled with Him, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So the answer isn't us. It's not adding the right mords. It's not finding the right bylaws. The answer is Jesus and Jesus alone. It's something He does for us. It's something He did for us on the cross. And so we must trust in Him. And, and so Paul goes on and, and tells us in a, word picture, in a couple of word pictures what that looks like. Verse 11. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you are buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all of our trespasses. And so it's these two familiar physical things uh, especially for that day, the, the elements of, of circumcision and of baptism, which are a part of the Jewish faith before Jesus. And he says, but in those physical things, we see spiritual truth, which is first of all this, that in Christ, we are all dying and rising. We're all dying and rising. Man, I've been so thankful. We mentioned it in the video earlier about all the baptisms we've had. We had a, a baptism in first service. Mason Wingo got baptized today, and he makes 18 to date for the year, people who've been baptized here through Calvary Chapel. And we're just thankful for that, uh, glad that God is, uh, is calling people to obedience to him in that way. Uh, and we're actually on June 25th, so the last Sunday of this month at 6 p.m., we're going to have a special celebration service outside, weather permitting. Uh, we're going to uh, sing some songs, share some things, have some people share their testimonies, and we're going to have an opportunity for people to be baptized outside. And so if you are thinking about considering getting baptized, uh, let us know. And if you want to be a part of that celebration, we'd love to have you uh, join us. And we're just wanting to celebrate the things God uh, is doing. Another cool thing that we started just today uh, is when you get baptized at Calvary Chapel, you get a, a cool new t-shirt. Uh, and so on the front of it, it says, dead to sin, alive in Christ. And on the back of it, it has this verse, so you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. And that's the picture of what we get in baptism. And it's actually literally this, is that in Christ you are a new creation. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. See, when you and I identify ourselves with Christ and his cross, something in us dies. And that's what that baptism is a picture of. It's something that God does in our heart, but baptism is this picture that we have died to our sins and our old ways and our old flesh and our old person. And because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, he's washed us clean. And because of his resurrection, he's resurrected us as a new 
creation. And so when we, when we think about all of those struggles we're having, all of those, those problems we're having, the mistakes we've made, the failures we've had, the frustrations of feeling like we're not enough, that we lack, that we fall short, that guy is dead. He's gone. He is old. He died with Jesus on the cross. And when we say yes and we agree with that, that old passes away and we literally become something new. That, that picture of circumcision, which in circumcision physically it cuts away flesh, but spiritually it cuts away that fleshly sinful part of us that causes us to head towards death. And so in Christ, you literally get a new identity. You become a new person when you ask Jesus to save you. So that's wonderful, right? That's, that's fantastic. But you may be sitting there going, that's nice and all, but I still struggle. I still sin. I still fall short. I, I still mess up. And like, when am I ever going to stop this struggle? And, and I just want you to know that if you feel that way today, that you're in the, in the midst of that struggle, I just want you to know, so do I. And probably so does everybody else in this room. And we know for sure that the Apostle Paul felt that way because he talks to us about it over in Romans chapter 7. Listen to this. He says it this way. He says, For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. And, and I remember the first time I read that, I think I was in college, and, and I mean, I just felt this like, weight come off my shoulders. Because, man, how many times have I felt that way? Like, I've tried to do the right thing, I want to do the right thing, and next thing I know, I'm like, oh, I've done the dumb thing again. But I'm not alone. Paul felt that struggle. The Apostle Paul, the greatest evangelist ever, the guy who wrote half the New Testament, he got this. And he goes on and says this about it. He says, now, if I do what I do not want, I'm no longer the one who does it, but is the sin that lives in me. So I discovered this law, that when I want to do good, evil is present with me. For my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin and the parts of my body. What a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this body of death? Isn't that a good question? Isn't that a raw question? That question you've ever asked yourself, like, man, when am I ever going to get through this? Here's the answer. Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, when we have those old habits and thoughts and natures come up, Paul is telling us that that is no longer who we are, and so we need to put it in its proper place. Those things are dead and gone. He's telling us to live like who we are now in Christ. So back in Colossians, if you'll jump to chapter 3, he tells us what that looks like. Chapter 3, verse 1 says this, So if you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. If you read through the New Testament and you note every time it says in Christ, it's going to tell you some wonderful things about who you are now that you're a Christian. So I tell you that you're redeemed and you're chosen. We sing these things, that, that, we are, that we are a new creation, that we're remade, that we're reborn, that we're raised up in life, that we're not who we were, that, we, that when God looks at us, he no longer sees us in our sin, but he sees Christ in his perfection. And so these are the words that God views you with. We just have to choose to believe it. We just have to choose to live like those things are true. I love what Paul says over in Philippians 3. He says, in any case, we should live up to whatever truth we've attained. And so if you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, you've attained these things. Now we've got to live like they are true. And so Paul goes on and tells us what to do when we still struggle with those decaying remains of our old nature. Chapter 3, verse 5. He says, therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. Did you hear that? You once walked in those ways, past tense. You once were living in them, past tense. But in Christ, that is no longer who you are. So when we slip and fall back into those dead remains, remember they are old. Paul tells us 
make a decision to break with the past. It goes on here in verse 8 and says this, but now put away all of the following, anger and wrath and malice and slander and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old self. That's not who you are. And have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. And so, so Paul kind of gives us this model. What do we do when we slip and we fall and we stumble? Well, we admit it. We own it. We say, man, man I'm acting like the old me again. And we confess that. We confess that to God. You know, and it tells us over in 1 John that if we are faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us of our sins. If we've hurt someone else, we confess it to them. And we ask for their forgiveness. Maybe, maybe we have a trusted Christian friend that we confess all our sins to and say, hey, would you pray for me and help me? But then once we've done those things, we've owned it, admitted it, confessed it, then we trust that Jesus forgave us. He paid for those sins. And then we move on in our newness. And we make a break with that old thing. And if we have to do it again tomorrow, and the next day we keep doing that, but we keep making a break with the old, living like we are new. You know, I think we're enamored with hero stories, not just because they're exciting uh, or, you know, or they're interesting or they've got really cool action figures, but because at the end of the day, we all want to be a hero. And we particularly want to be a hero in our own story. We, we want to be a better version of ourselves. We want to win the day and, and, and you know, win the battle. But here's the thing. You're not the hero of your story. Jesus is the hero of your story. And unless we live like he is the only hero of our story, we're going to find ourselves still in that struggle of the old dead things. Back in the middle of chapter 2, we jumped over a verse, verse 14, that, that gives us a really good picture of this. It says, He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us, and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. And this, uh, this, this word, certificate of debt, would have been very familiar in the Roman uh, mind and the Roman culture they lived in because they literally had certificates of debt. And so if you incurred a debt, whether it was a, a legal debt or a, you know, a financial debt or, or whatever debt, they would give you a piece of paper with your debt on it, and you had to take care of that or there were legal repercussions. Uh, this is an invoice book. How many of you have ever gotten an invoice for something, Right? So, so it's a bill, right, like for either goods or, or services rendered, and they write that down, and they tell you how much you pay, and then you have to pay it, right, or, or you owe them. You're in debt to them. And so, so, so Paul's essentially saying this, that every time that we um, have lived for ourselves and not for the truth of God, every time we've disobeyed one of God's laws, every time we've rejected the way that God set life up to live, he calls that a sin. And, and so, so, we, so we get an invoice for that. And you know what that invoice costs us? It's death. And so every time we, we do that, every time in your whole life that you've disobeyed God's laws, rejected his authority, lived your own way and not his way, you got one of these on your account. I just want you to think about how big your pile might be. I think mine would be pretty large, right? And so what he's saying is, is that Jesus collected all these up, got all our certificates of debt, and he nailed those to the cross and paid for them. They're done. They're gone. They're taken care of. He nailed them to the cross. So we've got to live like that's true. A couple of weeks ago, I was having breakfast with a friend over at Megan's Breakfast Nook. And, you know, and, and, and as usual, when I'm eating with somebody, we got done eating and we sat and we talked and we talked and we talked and we talked. And, you know, the waitress had already set the ticket on the table and we were talking. And pretty soon she came by and she picked it up and she says, hey, uh, I, I, I got to check something on this. I was like, okay. And then I noticed that she did it for all the other tables that were lined up next to ours. And I thought, that's weird. She must have messed up super bad, right? Like, I didn't know what she'd done wrong. And so anyway, so we kept talking, and she didn't come back, and she didn't come back, and she didn't come back. And eventually, I like, got her attention, and I was like, uh, where's our ticket? And she's like, oh, there's a lady that was sitting in the back, and she paid for all of these tables. And I was like, wait, what? Paid for everybody? Yeah, she paid for everybody. I was like, who is it? She's like, I have no idea. I was like, where'd she go? She's gone. And, and it was this, you know, it's wonderful, but it's also kind of, if you've ever had that happen to you, it's kind of a, an odd feeling because you're kind of sitting there helpless. You're like, wow, someone took care of my bill and I don't know them and they don't know me. And did they really pay? Is this really free? And you kind of sit there for a while and like this kind of uh, not knowing what to do. And eventually we just kind of had to get up and walk out like we stole something. And, you know, and, and we, but we, if we, had insisted to pay the bill again, that would have been ridiculous, wouldn't it? 
No, I insist. I've got to pay this debt that's already been paid. That would be, that'd be foolish. Are you trusting that God's words are true? Are you trusting that he paid the debt for your sin? Are you trusting that your dead, selfish, sinful nature is gone and that is wiped away by Christ's righteousness and that you're made new? Because it is. Now we've got to live like it's true. So today we're going to sing a last song. And as we sing that last song, you know, I don't know what part of this you need to respond to, but this is a time for response. Um, and so, so maybe there's some things that you need to, to pray about. Maybe there's some things that you need to deal with this morning. If you've never admitted that you're not the hero of your own story and asked Jesus to be the hero of your story, it, it works like this. God, I'm not the hero of my story, but I need you to be the hero of my story. And that you trust that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he paid your certificate of debt. And you ask him to do that. And if you want to do that this morning, we'd love to pray with you. If you're struggling in those old things, those, that flesh that wars against us, just like Paul talked about, and there's some things you need to let go of, maybe you just need to pray and ask God and ask others around you to help you release those things. And maybe you just need to commit today to believing that you're new, the old is gone, the new has come, and walk as Jesus is the first and only in your life. Would you guys stand with me today?